Uh, thank you, Siddharth. That was absolutely um, fascinating, if slightly depressing, <laughs> lecture. But, but um, uh, I don't think we were expecting expecting you to come and be tremendously cheerful tonight. But um, thank thank you for that. And and to discuss it, we've got Martin Barron, the editor of the Washington Post, and Rita Kapoor from the Quint. Uh, which um, I asked Rasmus for a one-line summary that you'll probably hate. And he said, well, if all else fails, you could describe it as the BuzzFeed of India. But do you, do you hate that? Uh, <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes, she hates it, okay. <laughs> Forget that I said that. But, um, uh, it gives... The new BuzzFeed. The new BuzzFeed, of, yeah, the, the nice, nice, nice BuzzFeed. Um, the un-BuzzFeed. The un-BuzzFeed of India. Okay, well, glad we sorted that one out. Um, um, you, you said... You ended up saying it's difficult to find a, a silver lining, um, and uh, I think we'd probably all agree, uh, having heard you speak. I mean, you, you hinted at this, but, but really a lot of the problems predate Modi, don't they? That, 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 that I guess what you're saying is that in the Indian media had got itself into a poor state already, ethically and financially, and in its dependence on certain business models, uh, and therefore was in a vulnerable position, and Modi came along and made that worse. Quite right. So I think... Uh, in a sense, the, the media's got itself to blame. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are long-term trends, and uh, particularly on the, uh, on the business model side. Um, you know, we've discussed this earlier, but something so simple and elementary as, um, you know, of excessive dependence on advertising revenue. To the, you know, so you have most newspapers, for example, are operating in a situation where 90% or 95% of their revenue comes, not from re- comes from advertising rather than reader subscriptions, which is completely absurd. And, uh, and, and now that we are moving to uh, digital, newspapers are confronting the fact that they don't, they've never had a paywall in print, let alone a pay, uh, you know, how do you then begin to think about a paywall for online? So, so as sources of revenue dry up, uh, you know, newspapers are scrambling to... Uh, so, so it began with just giving more and more space to advertisers, listening to them and their concerns much more. Uh, and when finally, you know, advertising also began to migrate, uh, then coming up with all kinds of dodgy schemes, all kinds of dodgy coverage, where oftentimes, uh, you know, you, you, you'd have a composite package struck, where a newspaper would say, fine, you buy a certain amount of advertising, and in exchange, you know, there'll be five or six stories as well, uh, and maybe, uh, uh, you know, other kinds of coverage against rivals. Uh, you know, the sky's the limit. And uh, it's very hard to, I mean, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence that those of us who've worked in these organizations, uh, you know, have. Uh, but obviously, none of this is, is, is recorded. Uh, so, yeah, the ethical issue has been, has been you know, has, has been there for some time. But all of that has become much worse. Uh, and, um, you know, and you know, governments have been, Governments have never been friendly to the media in the past, but I think we have a situation today where uh, this government is perhaps least uh, uh, well disposed towards free media, uh, you know, compared to its its last three or four predecessors. Rita, how much did you agree with Siddharth's talk tonight, and, and was he being too cheerful, or? <laughs> <laughs> no. I can just say I predicted this earlier in the yeah, afternoon. Yeah. Um, no, I think I think completely uh, 100% in agreement with everything that Siddharth has raised this evening. I think to the point uh, of you know this the malaise having been around earlier. I think that's true, but a, a few more things have happened since Modi has come into power. One is the gaming of social media, and therefore the pressure that comes. I think that that that, that is imposed or the regimenting that uh, Siddharth referred to. I think that wasn't there. I think this um, the binary of if you're of na- or being nationalistic or anti-nationalistic. I think this this completely. Um, if you were to take it, like the example from the Times of India headline that Siddharth gave, um, you have to be nationalistic. If you aren't, then you are anti-nationalistic, and and therefore the focus is on sentiment um, and rabble rousing and not on fact and journalism at all. I mean that that. It, that wasn't there to this extent um, uh, in the, uh, with the previous governments. Uh, and, I, and I think the paid news and the, therefore the, the threat perception of, um, you know, for, for print, for instance, of the government advertising drying up is much larger, therefore, because there is, it's not, it's no longer, 
uh, earlier the the arguments were no more nuanced even if it was paid news at least there was an attempt to disguise it which may in some ways be more dangerous but now it's completely blatant now it's um, either you're with the government or you're uh, there is absolutely no space for criticism because critis critical journalism is seen as hate or agenda driven uh, i don't think that was the case uh, earlier marty we heard about a country which has demanding a great deal of patriotism from, from its citizens, um, uh, a, a country with more polarization, a country in which the media have failing business models, a country in which the leader tries to delegitimize journalism. Do you see any parallels here? <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you were gonna, I had a feeling you were gonna ask me that. Um, I, um, yeah, there's some, par is, is this working? Uh, there are some parallels, but uh, we're not, at that stage uh, yet, and I hope we... Uh, we're not at that stage yet, and I, and I hope we don't end up there. Uh, certainly, I think uh, the president has... Uh, the only media that he favors is the media that favors him, uh, even though, uh, obviously, our Constitution calls for freedom of expression. Uh, um, it's interesting that just the other night, Saturday Night Live, a hugely popular comedy show, uh, mocked him, uh, and he tweeted out that there should be retribution and this sort of thing should be looked into. Uh, this is satire. Uh, it is free expression. Uh, it's the kind of thing that we've accepted in our country for a long time, and yet you have a president of the United States suggesting that there should be retribution against this and some sort of um, unspecified kind of investigation into that sort of thing. So um, our, our media environment's becoming far more polarized than it ever was before. Uh, there's no question. Uh, we're being uh, hounded uh, by people on social media as well. Uh, we have had to increase uh, security for any number of our, our journalists. We had to start that during the presidential campaign in 2016, uh, and that has continued. Uh, and that's concerning, and we're uncertain where that's going to lead. I don't think we're anywhere close to where India is. Uh, my concern is that we, I just don't want us to start going down that path. But I mean, we, we all saw that tweet demanding retribution, but, but is that something that actually worries people? Do you think that's five years down the, the line we might be there, or do you think America feels confident enough in its legal and I think, constitutional? Uh, yeah, you know what, I, I think the president's goal is basically to, um, certainly with his base, with his supporters, is to essentially disqualify uh, the outlets that are not in his camp, um, they're not necessarily opposed to him, but they're not in his camp, not 100% in his camp, to disqualify them as arbiters of fact. Um, and um, that he wants himself to be the only arbiter of fact, uh, and uh, he wants media outlets to essentially be a megaphone for uh, his his uh, account of events, uh, his assertion of facts, which in many instances are not actual facts. Uh, and he wants to disqualify the press as an independent arbiter of fact. Uh, and it's a little bit of a different, I think a little bit of a different game than what's happening in India, uh, is that he just simply would like us to be ignored, to be dismissed, so that if we publish anything that is contrary to his account, uh, to his version, uh, to his policies, then uh, it's, it's simply dismissed, it's not taken, it's not taken seriously. So now, to what extent do you think there is a, a Trump playbook that Modi has learned from or feels encouraged by, if, if Trump can get away with that, then yeah. I can, or do you think he would, that he would have done this anyway? So, so the two playbooks are quite different. Uh, I would say that uh, word, for, word for word, uh, Trump is far more vicious in what he says about the media than Mr. Modi. Modi is, very, Modi is very careful about his public utterances. So, uh, in fact, Modi, if, if Trump, is, Trump wants retribution for satire, uh, I believe there's a quote from Modi like about a, a year ago saying, I want people to make fun of me. You know, there's no harm if they crack a joke, right? But, so, so, the, so the public messaging is very different. But the way in which the systems of the two countries react is also... 180 degrees against each, uh, opposite, right? So in the US, the president is vicious and hostile, but the system keeps 
him on the straight and narrow, as it were, right? So it's not easy for him to, for retribution to be visited on a critic. In India, the prime minister says, ah, say what you want. You know, I, I encourage healthy criticism. But uh, you engage in healthy criticism and you find the case is filed or you, you know. So it's this disconnect that I, that, and I would much prefer the American, the American model where the guy says what yeah, he wants. We love John. <laughs> one has more bark than bite and the other one has more bite than bark. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, it's obviously preferable to have more bark than bite. Exactly. And, and essentially, you know, uh, uh, but, but the similarities would be, I suppose, the huge troll armies that both these leaders command. So there is, uh, uh, and, and perhaps in some ways in America, uh, the, you know, the, uh, they've, they've moved on from online threats to physical threats in, in ways that haven't fully happened in India yet, although we're getting there. Uh, uh, so I think that there are similarities. But uh, it's, it's this difference, you know, uh, Modi is careful about his, about his messaging. And uh, another difference is that Trump, even though he's abusive vis-a-vis -vis the press, has his press conferences, right? And so, so and you have some fireworks that say, you know, people, people ask questions and there was that, uh, you know, the, the whole thing with Acosta. Uh, Modi never puts himself in that position. I think the last time he was in anything resembling a press conference was when he, when he came to England in 2015, and there were two questions at, on Downing Street, and the second question was somebody from The Guardian asking you about 2002, and he didn't like that. And literally since then, uh, all his uh, press opportunities have been scripted. So you know, you, he, he gives uh, interviews to a select few, and the rules clearly appear to be no follow-up questions. So uh, it's, it's quite different. Trump doesn't have many press conferences, does he? He, do he doesn't have many, but he does use them as part of a show. Uh, I mean, he loves to, look, I mean, he, he performs best when he has an enemy. Uh, and it's why he keeps bringing up Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama. Uh, when he's short of an enemy, he always has us. Um, we're available all the time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, and uh, when he doesn't have anybody else, he's happy to take advantage of us. And the press conferences serve his, purposes, his purpose in portraying us as an enemy. Uh, in mocking us uh, and uh, not actually necessarily answering the questions right. uh, and not always answering them factually. Rita, I, I was listening to Siddharth and thinking, and, and you slightly made this point yourself, Siddharth, but, but actually this is a great opportunity for new players to come along and say, well, there's this corrupt old order and we're completely different and um, you, you, there's one world in which uh, huge audiences ought to be flooding to you because you're the only people that can be trusted. Well, some of that is thankfully happening. Yeah. Um, you know, after The Wire did, um, very heartening to know that, after The Wire did the Amit Shah, Jai Shah story, um, there was a huge flood of contributions to The Wire uh, because they knew that there is going to be this absolutely ridiculous uh, defamation case against them. Um, so there is, so we are, we are finding our readership is growing, the wire's readership is growing. Um, some of the other uh, warriors like this, print, caravan, um, the readership is growing. So that's, and, 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 you know, for instance, we run, we have this relationship with our audiences at the Quint where we ask them to send us fake news that they, what could be fake news to share that with us and we will try and do a fact check and verify it and put it back uh, uh, and put it back pretty much on WhatsApp, et cetera, where, uh, where, the, where the fake news goes, where the misinformation goes viral. And we find that that interaction with our readers is growing very fast and very rapidly. And it's, it's a, they're also um, a, questioning their own confirmation biases and they're having that conversation with us and they're sharing that with us and then, then they're converting that into blogs and you know putting it out. So there's, I know that this, this is a small pocket of people but I can see that it's growing um, and you know thankfully there is uh, platforms like, I never thought I'd say that, but thankfully there are the platforms like Facebook and Google which gives us the uh, level playing field to do that. But one worries because one also hears um, how algos can be tweaked, um, and you see a you see a bit of that happening as well. So it's not all uh, perfect, but the readers are coming to us and they are engaging with us. We've been nice about Trump, Facebook, and Google tonight. This is this is. <laughs> um, 
I'd love to hear um, from both of you. So we, 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 you've spoken very powerfully about the, the pressures on all media and, and the failings of a, a, a lot of Indian media. So how is it that the two of you are able to run organizations that are different uh, ethically and journalistically uh, in the face of all those pressures? Is, is, that a, is that partly down to a question of ownership? I think um, my sense is almost, an, almost exclusively due to that. We, we consciously uh, chose, I mean, if, if we had the resources, uh, me and my two uh, founding editors, if we had the resources to set up, a, set up a regular company, the way that Quint was, we would have perhaps gone down, the, down that route, but we didn't have, and we said, let's, let's be a not-for-profit and rely on uh, philanthropy, rely on readers. And uh, this has definitely insulated us, just as in my sense is that, you know, uh, um, Quint, because it's owned by the people who run it and there's no great outside investors, and, you know, so, th so it, it kind of insulates you. And it's not a coincidence that because let's not forget legacy media also, right? Uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, it's precisely those uh, media organizations, I would say Hindu, Indian Express, Business Standard, that uh, are sort of conventional med media houses. They don't, have, they don't have a range of other business interests. They're not, they're not overextended the way the Times of India or Hindustan Times or others are. Uh, they're narrowly focused on media. Uh, and so it's not, it's, to my mind, it's not surprising that these three names that I mentioned still hew very closely to what the mandate of a, of a proper news organization should be. So I would say that the ownership and the business model is integral to uh, the, the fact that you know, we're able to do what we do. That's, that's absolutely right. The fact that we don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about uh, anything else other than... Uh, than basically just paying salaries and keeping the ship running. I mean, that's really what it is. And uh, I think that's, that's what helps us uh, stay independent and stay free. Um, but you know what makes me wonder sometimes is, you know, when I look at, there's, an enti there's Times Now, which is um, the Times of India's news channel, um, which actually recently after the CRPF uh, Javans were killed, we, I actually heard the anchors say, that the separatists uh, who are supporting uh, Azad Kashmir, um, their security should be taken away. So we actually had a news anchor actually saying that these people should be killed. And at the same time, they have the same uh, media houses, another TV channel called Mumbai Mirror, uh, which actually says the opposite thing. So the same media house runs two um, uh, products, so to say, with completely <laughs> divergent. So there's very strange things happening in the country right now. Uh, Marty, we were talking, I mean, we know that at the moment the Washington Post and the New York Times are, are healthy and they're doing great journalism, but you were speaking earlier about the crisis in local journalism. Can you talk a bit more about that and whether those papers are going to be more susceptible to the kinds of pressures that Siddharth was talking about earlier? Yeah, well, I think certainly in the United States, uh, the news organizations that are doing the best are the ones that can play at a national level, and even an international level, like the Times, like the Post, uh, and some others as well, mag certain magazines, the New Yorker, for example, um, and the Wall Street Journal, and, and news organizations like that. The real crisis in American journalism is at the local level, and no one has come up with a real model yet uh, for, uh, for local journalism that can be replicated around the country. Maybe there are a few examples that, are, that show some promise, but that's, uh, that's about it. And I think it does make them susceptible to, to pressures. I mean, fortunately, many of them are owned by news organizations with a long history and a tradition uh, that, um, uh, where they would, resist that kind of, they would resist that kind of pressure and would not be susceptible to that. Uh, including the places where I've worked, uh, which was the Miami Herald in Florida, uh, the Los Angeles Times in, in California, the Boston Globe in Massachusetts. Uh, I don't think any of them would be susceptible to those kinds of pressures. Uh, but uh, I think that it, it could happen at other places and probably has happened at other places. And, um, and so I think that's a matter of concern. The bigger concern is not so much the pressure, but the fact that they don't, 
they don't actually have any reporters to cover government officials and um, to cover the police, to cover the school boards, to cover their local environment, to cover, um, to cover the courts, to cover all of the things that they should be covering, to cover the, the state government. Um, you know, in, ma in many states, the, there may be only one or two people uh, at the, in the state capitol uh, from the largest news organization in the state. Uh, and that, that individual, or maybe two individuals, is responsible for covering the governor. Both houses of the legislature, both houses of the legislature, uh, the politics, the policy, the, all the government agencies, everything like that. And the reality is that they can't cover, they, they can't do that. Uh, they certainly can't do investigations. And so government officials know that nobody is, is looking at what they're doing. Nobody is really holding them accountable. We've, um, we've got about uh, another 10 minutes or so, so I, I would be delighted to have questions from the audience. If you can, if you can, um, have you, we've got, we've got a microphone, so somebody put their hand up and grab a microphone. Yes, yeah. What, what do you do with the billions of dollars of lawsuits? I mean, how do you dispose of these? They just sit there? You... How do you do with this? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, you know, as I said, the, the, the pro I mean, the, these are intended... The process is the punishment, right? So, so the, the, uh, very often they're filed and they, the, the person who files them doesn't actively pursue them either, but they remain on the books to be activated. Uh, so in some cases, uh, you know, our physical presence is required in a court that's quite far away from Delhi. Uh, we, have, we have excellent lawyers and we are you know, confident that all of these cases will be, we will win all of them. And uh, I, I joked at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a gathering in Delhi last month that uh, I would love, love for the Supreme Court to say that uh, if somebody files a case of this kind, they should be prepared to surrender 1% of claim damages in the event of loss. Uh, uh, and and you know, we, that, that would take care of the corpus uh, that the wire is trying to build forever and ever, amen. So it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it basically takes up, it, it takes up time and space, um, time that we, you know, we would spend on journalism gets, you know, uh, you have to review things. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not as if it's, it's life-threatening or business-threatening. It just, it's just a harassment. But I, but I also think that there's legal fees to worry about, which, is, uh, which can be quite crippling and which is, again, resources which then get diverted from uh, uh, journalism. Yeah. And I think that is one of the intentions. The intentions is to, uh, to do that. I mean, I've, I've overheard to... Um, to um, Pranoy and Raghav had this conversation to say they were comparing notes on whose IT slash ED raid was more dehumanizing. You know, <laughs> they came to my office. They came to my office. They came to my house. They were in my house for 24 hours. I mean, so that's where the conversation is going. And so you're you're spending time, money, effort. It's right. it's and that's the the intention is. Thankfully, what is not happening uh, is uh, I don't think they're being effective in trying to delegitimize. Uh, uh, which is also one of the intentions. I don't think that has happened, and, and thank God for that. Another, yes. Two sort of questions near each other there. Take the gentleman first. I, I do think it's very gloomy, um, and I, I think you were right to point out that it, while the media might be in the front line, it, it's a whole range of institutions academe, um, judiciary, and so on, that are coming uh, under pressure. I, I, um, I mean, picking up the, uh, the, the question that Alan asked, in terms of trends, do you think, do you have any hope that um, were the uh, opposition to win, things might get easier? It Undoubtedly, does look as if Modi will probably win on current um, yeah, estimates, but I mean, do you have any hope about, about changes? No, I don't doubt that... Uh, a lot of the pressure will get relieved, but a lot of this stuff lingers on. And you know, the you know, uh, I, I haven't spoken about uh, you know the co communalization of the public sphere that has happened. You see a lot of uh, 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 re religious bigotry that has been spread. Uh, all of that stuff lingers in the atmosphere and takes years to go away. Uh, and I think that the functioning of some of these, you know. I think what the government has done to the Central Bureau of Investigation, what it has done to the Reserve Bank of India, uh, these are all models that future governments will follow. So once a bad precedent has been set, uh, it becomes easy for other governments. So there would be, I, I would imagine, momentary relief, 
were there to be a change of government. But uh, unless something fundamental is done by way of uh, institutional reform, uh, these bad practices will probably resurface again and again. Next question here. Yeah. Thank you so much for your words today. Um, I was curious if you could speak a bit to the pros and cons of incorporating outside of the country as a sort of measure of you know, protection against the type of legal har harassment that you described. Yeah. It, it doesn't, I think incorporating outside doesn't protect uh, you from legal uh, harassment because uh, essentially you know, you're liable for wherever you operate, right? So, uh, so I would imagine that even if the wire were to be set up in London, but if you're disseminating information that is deemed to be defamatory, quote unquote, so-called, uh, in Ahmedabad, then somebody will, can and will file a case. So I don't think that that uh, necessarily protects you. And I would say, you know, the laws in India are so, uh, I mean, there's so much of suspicion of the foreigner, right? It's, it's ironic, right? The same government that, you know, is very happy to court FDI in all kinds of fields, including defense and so on, and strike all kinds of deals, but when it comes to uh, the media, is, is, is completely paranoid and, and, and spreads this kind of idea that, so, so if, if somebody, if, if a news organization were to be registered abroad and be functioning in India, I'm sure that would be, that would make them a target for attack. So, It'd be anti-national to begin with. Yeah, exactly, anti-national. <laughs> yes, question there. Start my question for you. Another five years of Modi and weakening of institutions. So where does that take India? And where does it take the region? Because next, your next door neighbor has a similar pattern. Uh, is it going to be death of journalism? Or a new kind of journalism will then get created? See, the, the, the silver lining that I didn't talk about, but you know, the fact is that one of the benefits of the digital era is that you can't kill journalism now, right? You can't kill a story. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the information will come out and it will, you know, it will find its level. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't worry about, and you know, even if some of these lawsuits, you know, uh, even if financially we get crippled, uh, it's, you know, very, it's not difficult to revert to a, a completely stripped down, low cost version and just come out, right? Uh, so, I, you know, but I, I worry about um, what, is being done to the uh, integrity of a whole range of institutions. For example, the university system. The, you know, the way in which uh, the autonomy of universities uh, is being ridden roughshod over. Uh, I worry about what they've done to the bureaucracy. I worry about, you know, you name it. And, and you know, these are all leaving toxic imprints, uh, which will be very hard to correct or reverse uh, over a long period of time. So the, the real question is not what happens if Modi gets another five years, but the question I think that, that you were asking that, you know, that even if Modi were to be defeated, how easily can some of these things be reversed? And I would say that it's not easy because uh, just on the communal issue alone, uh, so much of poison has been, you know, look at the Congress government which was elected in, in Madhya Pradesh. Within a week of coming to power, they're slapping the same old cases on about cow slaughter, you know, invo misusing the National Security Act against people suspected of, of cow smuggling. Because that's, that's the legacy they've inherited. And they're too scared to say that's all rubbish, I'm going to abandon it, for fear of somebody accusing them of not being good Hindus, quote unquote. Right? So it's this, uh, this toxic, you know, this hyper-nationalist and this, you know, uh, the uh, uh, mixing up of religion and national identity that has happened uh, over the last four years. It channels, I mean, uh, what makes me particularly worried about the media is that big channels, she mentioned Times Now and others, I mean, big channels have become vehicles for uh, religious hate mongering today. This is new. Uh, Ten years ago, you know, maybe a small regional paper in Gujarat, you could say, has, is, is engaging in communal propaganda. But today, your biggest channels, day after day, engage in vituperative propaganda against Muslims, uh, uh, they, the way they treat Kashmiris, every Kashmiri is, is labeled as a anti-national, as a terrorist, as a, you know, so it's, uh, and, and this, is main, this is mainstream media. And, and that's what's kind of worrying when I uh, consider the long-term impact of this. We have time for probably two more questions. So one, one of the first. Sorry. 
Richard Morgan from Anglo-American, just speaking as a representative of business. Um, have business changed the tune at all? Have they been the, the way of being depicted as perhaps the villains in the piece? Do they realise there's a civil society benefit to be gained by, um, by helping out at all? Well, you have business and you have business. So, so uh, I would say companies that, are, that have hitched, their wag, hitched, the, hitched themselves to the government's you know, chariot uh, are the ones who are most prickly and litigious uh, uh, and very, very trigger happy when it comes to slap suits and so on and so forth. But you have a lot, you know, others who are uh, you know, uh, also open, you know, who, who recognize the value of having a free press. And you know, uh, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't paint the entire business sector with one brush, but there are some that uh, clearly don't value uh, you know, freedom of the press. Uh, but there is a section that does. I can tell you that even there is, there is the lot that is slapping suits and is completely aligned uh, with the ruling party. But there is, we know because we are an advertiser uh, revenue driven entity, that a lot of uh, business houses are choosing not to advertise with the Quint, for instance, whether it's just straightforward display ad or programmatic ad or whatever, because they just don't want to be seen to be identifying. So, so, so it's passive, but um, it's careful. I'm happy just to start to go off on a tangent. We were talking this afternoon uh, about the sense of which the, 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 the American press has come under a, a tremendous amount of attack from certain quarters in recent years. There are some signs now that people are beginning to rally to it and appreciate it and, and come to its defense. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think that you've uh, seen that in a variety of ways that uh, certain segments of the public have come to the to the cause of, of joined sort of the cause of the of, of the press. Uh, you see that in the in the rapidly growing subscriptions at places like the uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, they've escalated quite rapidly over the last several years, uh, and that's been encouraging. You also see some uh, polling data that over the last uh, couple of years actual trust in the press uh, in the United States has actually gone up. Now, the disturbing part of that is that it's gone up dramatically among Democrats, uh, and it hasn't gone up much at all among Republicans, if, if any. Uh, but it's gone up among, uh, among independents. Uh, so uh, what you're seeing is a strong support in certain segments of, uh, among certain segments of the American public. Uh, but a deepening polarization uh, in the consumption of media and in, and in levels of trust. There's one question. Uh, well, we've only got time for one. Well, there are two here, and so that we can have two with the microphones close to each other. So, why don't you uh, ask two questions in one, and then we'll take them together. Well, thank you. Uh, mine is pretty much related to what you were talking recently. Uh, it's been, I mean, it's it's mainly global that uh, many in these times where uh, legacy media is losing in some many places credibility, uh, they are arousing these new these new startups that uh, maybe trying to I mean, or with the idea of, of independent reporting, they are gathering lots of support. But that support, do you think it's related? to the independent media uh, speech, or it's also related to some partisanship from the people that support that media? And how do you deal with that? The expectations of the readers, what are the readers that you are uh, receiving and, and their expectations, and how do you deal with that? Not to become like a, a, a partisan media uh, in this environment, because uh, it's, it's like what would happen when this change? And, and we know in some countries like the US, it's like uh, pretty much like, a, you have this uh, changing uh, media, uh, t changing uh, governments, and how do you expect to react people wi when that happens? Okay, It's uh, sort of related. So my question was about the role of philanthropy and whether you're positive. In fact, it relates to your previous question about the role of philanthropy in supporting independent media, given that you're registered as a not-for-profit entity and there are other publications as well. I mean, there are challenges, so if you can speak to that a okay. bit. Okay. Uh, they're both excellent questions. Um, I think uh, in response to your question, I mean, this is something that we, we need to guard against uh, because um, uh, it, it is the fact that 
there is an overlap between those who want and value independent media and uh, and and they and they want and value it in the context of the fact that so called mainstream media has basically stopped being critical of the establishment right so there is a sense in which they are anti establishment the these readers so there's an overlap between the desire for independent media and their own political perspective uh, which uh, which poses a challenge for us because and and the only way to to deal with that i think is to occasionally irritate one's readers and and come up with things that they say oh why did the wire print that and i say well tough this is i mean we we do it you know and, and so so if uh, and uh, you, you know it's it's if if they if there's a, there is a government initiative that works i'm quite happy and i think it's important for the wire to report it in the way that it in a proper way even if that disappoints uh you know others uh that's the, uh, quite frankly that's the only way that i can see around this this problem and also to be to be um you know to 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 keep editorial and opinion i mean to keep reporting and editorializing separate as far as possible so that a, a news story uh should not be overlaid with the opinion and perspective of the person writing it uh, you know uh, of course you know you give background and you have some analysis uh, but it should not be ideological or should not be opinionated that's another way but this is a struggle uh, your question on philanthropy um you know we we've been fortunate to have the support of the uh, this foundation in bangalore called the independent public spirited media foundation uh, and also from a few other people but i would say that there is you know uh, you know when i when i said that the media needs i mean independent media needs a uh, you know you, you need a an institutional ecosystem uh which respects the rule of law and which you know functions in a democratic transparent manner i mean that there should not be a situation where government ministers lean on donors right so so you it's difficult to have a, a philanthropically driven independent media if ministers are going to badger uh uh philanthropists and high net worth individuals saying why did you give money to so and so recently there was a there was a story in a, in one of the websites in india uh about uh how a number of indian private universities are being denied uh the label of institution of excellence by the government uh because there is an intelligence bureau report apparently uh of of how some of the professors and promoters of these university these universities uh have been doing various things against the government and one of the issues mentioned is that many of them have uh, supported the wire financially and so then the, i don't i don't know how accurate the story is but if but if it's true, even if it's not true the fact is it's you know it's likely to have a chilling effect on any on any any would be donor because if you say well you know it's uh um you know i'm not only going to going to uh, go after you individually but i'm going to cripple the university you're associated with and i'm going to you know uh, raid your mother in law's tax uh, you know if if it's going to be all out if that's the perception that's created then obviously it becomes difficult for for ph- philanthropists to be philanthropic uh and so they, they you know they shouldn't be so ideally we want a situation where a rule of law prevails and people are free to donate their money if they want to and there shouldn't be any kind of political consequences but sadly that's not the case right now i know we could carry on talking like this uh for a long time most of the evening but um but we have to have a drink uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is oxford after all um and after that we have to eat so we have to get our priorities right but um uh can we thank sidart for giving us so much to talk about and also to marty and utu for coming and talking to